combines history and archaeology and illustrates beautifully something of the long time frame covered by necessarily by our activities. Um, the title, uh, which you can see, Time Thinking, Archaeology and the Battle of Hattin, Uh, I should perhaps say a word about, our speaker will explain, but this is of course the world changing battle fought on the 4th of July, 1180, what is it Rafi? 1187. 1187, thank you, in which Saladin booted the crusaders out of the holy land, not to put too fine a point on it. Our speaker, Dr. Raphael Lewis, is known for his creative and innovative approaches to archaeology. He's a senior lecturer in the Department of Land of Israel Studies at the Ashkelon Academic College, a senior fellow at the WF Albright Institute of Archaeological Research in Jerusalem, and also an associate researcher at the Zinman Institute of Archaeology at the University of Haifa. He is a field archaeology focusing on methodology, fieldwork, landscape archaeology, which we'll be hearing about, Jerusalem, and the archaeology of the Latin East. That, I trust, is not me uh, emanating. No. Maybe it's a Latin. Okay, start watching, you'll see. It is. No, it's more like the Crusaders, isn't it? <laughs> he yes. directs several projects. <laughs> the, ba the, ba the battle has started. <laughs> <laughs> the battle has started. Conflict always. I won't yeah. list them all, but they include the landscape of Hattin archaeological project. And he is um, uh, uh, has been a co-director on the Mount Zion excavations project which our previous speaker, uh, Shimon Gibson, directs. Um, pleased to hear him, see him here today. And with which the society has been closely linked over the years, one way up and another. Uh, he's published a number of um, interesting and important articles and um, continues to publish widely. Um, and so it's with great pleasure that I introduce um, Rafi Lewis to speak to us on um, the Battle of Hattin. Well, thank you very much, Tessa, for this uh, wonderful uh, introduction. And, uh, and also, if I already say many thanks to, to Anthony and to Sheila for all their help, help in the last few weeks for, uh, for making this uh, really happen. Well, I would like to start with a very interesting description of, uh, uh, by the French traveler, Victor Guerin, after one of his uh, visits to the Horns of Chitin, to the volcano of the Horns of Chitin, in the mid-1870s. Um, so this is how he describes, he describes it quite uh, plastically. A year after the end of this decisive battle, the hill of Chitin and its plain were still marked by the defeat. In every step made, human bones were crushed. Even today, after many hundreds of years, I was told by the people of Chitin, the village of course, that the blade of their plow often cuts through human bones that originate, no doubt, in the terrible massacre that occurred on those plains, cursed in Christian memory. So, <laughs> Very uh, dramatic uh, description uh, made by, uh, by Victor Guerin that we've probably all heard about, uh, raises a few main quest questions re regarding the battlefield that we're going to talk about. And those uh, uh, quite, quite provoked uh, questions uh, are as follows. First of all, the first question is about the memory of the historical event. Is it possible that the people of Chitin, the village of Chitin, which Victor Guerin is, is visiting or, or meeting in the 19th century have a real memory. How, how uh, uh, strong is the memory that those people have uh, taking into account that they are probably not the descendants of the people who actually witnessed the battlefield from the first place. So this is one question about that his, uh, his description is, 
is provoking. Another question is related to the archaeology of the historical event. Guerin wasn't the only person who was visiting the plain of Kitin. You can see here in a 19th century photograph, 1950s actually, from the mid 1950s photograph of the plain of Kitin. Um, many people have visited the plain of Kitin, but where is the archaeology? If we're talking about a battle, a battlefield, an event which hundreds of people have died in, which have, uh, uh, was the clash between uh, uh, great forces of, of great numbers of men, how come that no arrowheads, no uh, spearheads, uh, pieces of arm, arms and armor uh, never surfaced uh, and never came, uh, uh, came out to the public, never, never, were never found? And this drove me many years ago, I think after I was uh, visiting with a very good tourist guide, actually, at the battlefield, uh, I was actually thought to myself, where well, we have a very interesting historical story that I will tell you about briefly, but where is the archaeology? How do we find the archaeology? How do we find the archaeology of, uh, of an event which lasted um, about a day and a half in total, and over an area of uh, about 30 kilometers? How do we find? the material culture, the archaeology of such an event. So, as you know, um, in the Levant, there is no shortage of, uh, of conflicts from different, part, uh, different scales, different characters, different periods. Some of them are more uh, modern than the others. A good number of those conflicts were actually studied and researched by archaeologists over the year, but there is one common denominator for all of those uh, conflicts altogether, which were studied archaeologically, and this is the fact that in one, one way or another, they are related to urban settings or to an urbanic archaeological site. We can say this about, for instance, the Assyrian siege of, uh, of Lachish, the well-known Assyrian siege. We have it from the forces. Uh, from the from our sources, and we also have the archaeological studies about it. The same thing about the different siege operations that were taking place during the Great Revolt against the Romans, including the one that you see here on the bottom right, and of course uh, the hideout complexes, very famous uh, and with a very interesting debate on whether uh, those all belong to the Balkhova Revolt of um, uh, 132 or is it, or some of them may be um, uh, already related to, to the earlier event of uh, the Great Revolt against the Romans. And so those were studied archaeologically, but all of them are actually related in one way or another to, to a site, to a, build, to a build site, to an urban site, or to a human settlement. There is one kind of, uh, uh, of conflict that was never studied archaeologically, and funny enough, you know, we are in the in Israel. We are maybe we can nickname our land the land of conflicts. We have conflicts uh, all around us from different periods, as I as I said. But no battlefield was ever was ever archaeologically examined in a in a in a very um, uh, in a good in a good way. And when I uh, decided to uh, uh, to start on my PhD studies back in uh, 2006. Uh, this struck me together with uh, with, uh, with with Gibson actually Shimon Gibson was was present here who actually pointed me to that absence in uh, in research. He said, "Listen, there's so many battlefields here. What about uh, studying them?" So I decided to uh, uh, to go for it and to try to uh, to find the material signature of battlefields. But and specifically because I was the first one to, to do so. I chose a battlefield which really interested me, and that was uh, the battlefield of uh, Chitin, which I'm going to, to talk about uh, today. So this is a little bit of, uh, of background. Now, uh, I would really like to dedicate this, uh, this lecture to the memory of a very good friend, uh, an excellent scholar, um, the person probably with the best sense and, and witty uh, sense of humor I've ever, I've ever known, and also, in many ways, was my uh, one of my mentors. This is uh, Dr. Nick Slope, uh, who passed away. He was part of our Manzan team, and we all miss him and uh, and really cherish his um, his memory. Um, so this is uh, this is uh, for Nick. You can see Nick here in the bottom uh, two photographs. Uh, we went together uh, during one of the years. We joined the reenactment of the Battle of Chitin, and lucky enough, there was a television crew over there who, as I told them, listen. Yeah, one of the one of the 
ex world expert on archaeology and on the archaeological and the history of uh, of Nelson and battlefields. Uh, you should talk to the guy, and uh, I think he really enjoyed uh, the interview that uh, that they did uh, they did with him. So this is uh, Nick Slope being interviewed on the battlefield of uh, of Chitin. and you can see that the reenactors in the in the background, one of them, two of them are getting into their uh, uh, Peugeot two hundred and five, I think. Anyhow, so. Um, a little bit about the historical background, and I'll do this very briefly because we want to get to the archaeology. And if we focus only on the historical sources and the different, all the different people and and actions which happened, uh, we will never get to it because we have a very limited uh, uh, time frame today. Well, the 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 Hatim campaign was part of the jihad war, basically declared on the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem uh, after Jerusalem was taken by the Crusader on July 15. 1099 at the end of the first crusade after five weeks of, uh, of siege which uh, 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 you've actually heard about or many of you have heard about uh, uh, from the previous lecture take uh, given by uh, professor Shimon Gibson and uh, we're talking about the battlefield uh, the battlefield itself and this is a little map that I've uh, made which is based on a previous uh, study that was made by uh, uh, Benjamin Zev Kedar of the battlefield. Uh, you can see that we're talking about a huge area. We basically we're talking about uh, an area of over 30 kilometers. The battlefield. We're not specific about it. We're not talking about a specific field, but actually, the battlefield was um, uh, a battle in motion. Something which started way uh, in the center of Galilee, but by the springs of Sephari that you can see over here, throughout the valley of Turan. This is the first day of the of the battle. Then um, uh, encampment th that was opened by uh, today's Golani Junction and an old seasonal pool known as uh, uh, the Pool of Maskana during the 3rd of July uh, evening. And then the rest of the battle, which, is, which occurred on the 4th of July 1187, happened uh, along the road to Tiberias and ended by the volcanic hill known as the Horns of Hittim. Um, the forces of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem started gathering in the spr spring of Sephari, springs of Sephari, which we, where you have an abundance of, abundance of water, and also you can protect your, uh, uh, your horses there very easily with the hills around. This was the traditional encampment site of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem. Every time there was a provocation that came from uh, at the northern sector or the northern area of the country, this is where they would gather. They already started gathering there in May, while the Muslims actually um, started moving their forces uh, towards the Golan Heights. And then at a certain point, they've crossed the Jordan and positioned themselves inside the Latin Kingdom's uh, area uh, along uh, uh, key, key positions uh, in the Galilee. A little bit about the forces, I, I would not go, but you can see that uh, we're talking about uh, 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 numbers which are about the ratio of, of uh, five Muslim warriors for every crusader, about five Muslim warriors for every, for every crusader fighting in this, uh, in this battle. So the ratio is not in favor of the crusaders or the Franks as I may call them. Uh, but still, it never really uh, bothered them before because their type of uh, uh, strategy uh, used to work usually. Um, in late June 1187, the Muslims are crossing the Jordan River and positioning themselves along key positions along the uh, along the uh, in the Galilee in the Lower Galilee. One of those positions was, of course, uh, Mount Tabor, as you can see so nicely here in this photograph of uh, Richard Cleave. Um, uh, Salah Hadin is trying to draw out the crusaders from the springs of Sephari. He's trying to bring them out into the open field. And the way that he's doing so is by skirmishing dip different positions in, uh, in the Lower Galilee. One of them is the monastery on Mount Tabor. Uh, his troops are going up to the mountain. They are burning down the monastery in order to try to draw down or to draw out the, the, the Franks from their positions uh, in the springs of uh, Sephari. This, uh, this obviously doesn't, uh, doesn't work. So on the 2nd of July, one day before the battle starts, he's sending one of his um, uh, troops, Salah Hadin is sending one of his troops 
they are taking Tiberias and they are placing its castle under siege. Now, in Tiberias, as you can see here, there is, there is a real princess. There is a, a real Frankish princess. Her name is Ashiv, and she is the wife of Raymond of Tripoli, who's, who is also the prince of the Galilee. This is his land. This is the land under his, uh, uh, under his domain. And his wife is under siege now by Saladin's troops uh, in Tiberias. Now, um, the king, King Gideluzunyan, uh, Ashiv's husband, uh, Raymond of Tripoli, they are all now in Sepphoris, and they have to decide on whether to march on Tiberias to answer the provocation that was made by Salah Adin, or to stay in the springs of Sephiri where they have water, when they, where they can uh, actually uh, 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 do their strategic or do their, um, uh, uh, their fighting uh, uh, attack uh, techniques in the, in the best way. And uh, the provocation caused by the, uh, caused the Franks uh, at the end uh, on the third, on the night on the 2nd of, uh, of July, 1187, um, at the beginning of the night, there was a quarrel basically in, uh, in the camp, in the Crusader camp. Uh, in the beginning, a decision was made uh, to stay at the Springs of Sephiri, but after uh, the head of, uh, of the Templar, uh, uh, Gerard de Ritfort, convinced the king to march on Tiber Tiberias, on the very early in the morning of uh, July 3rd, the Franks started marching towards uh, Tiberias from uh, the springs of, uh, of uh, Sephiri. The Frankish forces started moving on very early in the morning, probably when they reached the valley of Turan, which is just to the northeast of, uh, of the springs of Sephiri. The Muslims began to uh, uh, skirmishing them with endless attack by the mounted archers. The march was very slow. It was a very hot day in July. Um, not, not many uh, water sources along the way, if any at all. And um, the Franks moved basically in three different uh, groups. Each one of those groups uh, had about 300 uh, knights, uh, heavily armed knights, with rings of defense around them, uh, which basically uh, the idea was that the mounted knights would be protected by uh, foot soldiers, uh, usually with archers and spears that would withdraw the, the Muslims or the Muslims uh, uh, in with their, uh, um, um, with their archers from, from uh, hitting the, the horses. Men at that time uh, were well protected uh, by four layers of armor, basically, but horses were not. So once a horse was uh, was struck, uh, there was no the knight was uh, was very vulnerable and had to uh, uh, to get down from the horse, of course. So the idea was basically uh, to circle the main body of armed knight with uh, with foot soldiers to uh, uh, that they will drive away the attacks which were which were made by uh, by Muslims. Uh, uh, um, uh, archers, or mounted archers, uh, to be more um, uh, specifically. It was a very long march on that day. They've actually marched over 17 kilometers, and when they've reached a seasonal, uh, a small, a small village known for the seasonal pool uh, next to him, known as uh, as Maskana. Maskana in Hebrew means Mishkenot, which is basically dwelling. It's a, it's a name. It's a village that was there already in the fifth century. Um, and when they reached the, the village of, uh, of Maskana, they've decided to camp for the night, uh, but the, the attacks didn't stop during the night. And on the night of the 3rd of July, 1187, basically the Frankish army didn't get off their horses. They, were, they kept on being uh, attacked by the Muslims all throughout the night. While Salah Adin was already positioned in very in, in all of those key points along the along the route of uh, of the Franks to Tiberias, he also uh, used that time in order to be, bring more supplies from uh, from Tiberias, uh, more arrows, more more warriors, and uh, and things like this. But basically, the fighting didn't stop throughout uh, the night of the of July the third. 
When the sun set on, uh, on the 3rd of July, uh, the fighting didn't stop, as I said. And um, the following day, the sun rose on both armies. <laughs> we'll see at what time uh, very, very shortly, exactly what time the sun was, uh, was rising. And uh, um, a few things, very interesting things happened. First of all, the France kept on marching towards the east, towards Tiberias. Um, there is a big question here on whether they were still trying to reach Tiberias, or maybe because of the lack of water, they were actually trying to go for another location, which is known as the Springs of Chitin. The Springs of Chitin, just below the volcanic hill of Chitin, where the final stages of the battle took place. We know of a few things, a few events which happened, but before the archaeological study that I'm presenting to you today, we were not able to point them, uh, let's say, to put them geographically as a specific point, and also uh, to put them in sequence. We do know that a certain, at a certain point, the Muslims burned the fields around France. We know that the vanguard laid by Raymond of Tripoli, you remember the guy that his wife is, is basically, she is the one who's, who's still in Tiberias. They charged against the Muslims, against the Muslim troops, uh, very unsuccessfully. Basically, uh, the Muslim force that was blocking the, the way um, uh, to the vanguard uh, opened up and the vanguard just uh, uh, rode right uh, through it uh, uh, and then the Muslims closed back and uh, Raymond of Tripoli uh, went out of the battlefield and basically out of, uh, out of, the, of the battle. Uh, we also know that at a certain point the uh, infantry fled to the horns of Chitim, leaving the main body of knights unprotected behind. All of this led basically to the uh, uh, Muslim victory, which is marked by the fall of the red tent of the Frankish knight, which was positioned uh, uh, probably uh, at some uh, close to the, to the mountain itself, or maybe even on the mountain, as we will see soon. Um, so uh, the red tent falls, the imprisonment, uh, the King Guy de Lusignan is imprisoned, um, then it followed by the massacre of the Templar and Hospitaller Knights, uh, the beheading of Count uh, Renaud de Chatillon, who was uh, the Prince of Karak and Saladin's uh, uh, worst enemy, uh, a very uh, ruthless man, a very uh, uh, colorful uh, uh, person whose, uh, whose provocations uh, throughout the, um, uh, during the, towards the end of the 12th century has basically uh, caused some of the worst clashes uh, between uh, the Muslims and, uh, and the Franks. And uh, finally, and maybe the most important, uh, at least for the Christian world, and uh, the catastrophe which, which basically led to the Third Crusade was the capture of the relic of the True Cross. As you can see in this image below, and the one that was so kindly uh, also uh, posted on uh, on the advertisement for this uh, for this lecture uh, earlier, um, as as it was uh, drawn by Matthew Paris, um, uh, an English monk in the middle of the 13th century, so uh, almost 100 years after the event itself, but still a very interesting uh, um, uh, illustration of the capture of the True Cross. The total defeat uh, of the Franks uh, by the horns of Chitin on the fields that you see in front of you had led to the fall of the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem and basically uh, was the main initiative for the Third Crusade. For the Third Crusade, but that's a, but that's a different story for, uh, for, another, uh, for another lecture or even uh, more than one. Um, so this was a little bit of uh, the historical background for those of you who are not uh, familiar. I'm sorry, it was very, very short and very uh, sort of like only, only the highlights of, uh, of the main events. Um, uh, now I would like to ask uh, some, uh, some questions which are related more to the archaeology of, uh, of the whole thing. Um, so the written sources on the Battle of Chitin were studied quite uh, extensively and luckily enough we have uh, uh, first eye uh, witnesses or evidence of people who were actually in the battlefield itself from both sides, 
from both the Frankish side and the Muslim side, and those are those people actually wrote letters and documents which uh, which gave us a, a witness uh, a good witness of uh, of the events, and those were studied quite uh, 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 quite extensively by Praver, by Kerd by Kerdar, by uh, uh, by by many different uh, scholars. Uh, but the battlefield itself, as I told you earlier, was never studied. So, how does one study a battlefield? And this is an, uh, it's sort of an open question, but uh, because of the format, I will, uh, I will try to answer it myself. Um, is it enough to go to a battlefield with a good metal detector and a good uh, uh, geographic information system to find the arrowheads or to try to locate the arrowheads and to, to put them in on a good map? Would this be enough, or is it uh, a little bit more complicated? Taking into account um, a few questions. Is a battlefield an archaeological site? How do you define the limits of such a battlefield? And as I told you, the battlefield of Chitin is actually took over an area of 30 kilometers. 30 kilometers by 10 kilometers. That's a huge area. What are the boundaries of such site? How does one study archaeologically a site list or dispersed sites? And, and basically what we're trying to do here is to find uh, uh, the material remains of a catastrophe or maybe of a, of a destruction. Usually uh, in archaeological sites or in urban archaeological sites, we have the destruction layer. We can find the destruction layer of the siege of uh, San Fidir of Lachish, and then say this is this is basically um, the archaeological layer which is related to that specific point of time in human history. How do you do it on an open field? How do you do it on an open field when a battlefield is a very dynamic kind of uh, uh, of environment? People went back to plowing those fields very shortly after um, um, the the battle ended. How do you do this? How do you actually do this? And even more interestingly, and here I'm coming to this, um, this um, uh, uh, word or, that I was using of time thinking, time thinking in archaeology. How actually, uh, and this is something that was uh, 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 first read by uh, uh, the father of uh, landscape archaeology, O.G.S. Crawford, he was uh, 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 basically uh, put a, saying that archaeology is if you're you're dealing with time thinking. Um, usually, archaeologists are dealing with periods, and you know we're very lucky to be able to differentiate in our um, site like uh, Mount Zion excavations uh, if we are managing to differentiate between the early Roman period and the middle Roman period. We're very happy about it. How do one find a specific day? In the history of human of uh, of humans, a specific uh, day in human duration, and how do you do it when you don't have a destruction layer? When you don't have a destruction layer such as the one that I've been excavating with uh, with my fellow friends uh, from the Mount Zion expedition in Jer expedition in Jerusalem. So how does one do it in a, in an open field? Well, archaeology of conflict, also known as battlefield archaeology, is a research dis discipline which was developed from landscape archaeology. And some of you are probably familiar with the works of people from the University of Glasgow, such as Tony Pollard and Ian Banks, or uh, the works which were conducted by uh, Doug Scott uh, on the Battle of Little Bighorn in the States. Uh, and they've been doing it for quite a while. But I found out that not much, not much has been put in into the research framework. Or we have a discipline here which doesn't have a, a very strong, as far as I see it, a uh, research framework. And I think um, we're dealing here with something which is, which is quite uh, important because we are trying to find a specific moment in human duration, not a period, but a moment or a specific event. And once we take it very, very seriously, uh, in terms of the archaeological methods and the field methods that we are using. So, um, going into the research framework itself, I'll be using a very nice, uh, uh, very nice words which were written by Collingwood, the archaeologist and the philosopher from Oxford, 
who said in, who wrote in his biography, in his very short biography, the following uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, sentence. History books begin and end, but the events they describe do not. I say this again. History books begin and end, but the events they describe do not. Now we can understand Collingwood's words in a few different ways. Um, let's start with archaeologically, the archaeological way to understand the Collingwood words. Well, as I said earlier, um, when the fighting ended on the 4th of July, 1187, the artifacts and the different objects which were scattered in the field were not waiting for us. The fields were plowed. Areas went, went under development. Uh, environmental forces, animals, all of those things, uh, human, uh, including human, uh, human activity, have shifted things around and has, has, has changed the way that the landscape looks today from the way that it looked in the past. You can see, of course, animals. You can see this is a, a plan to build a new city to the south of the horns of, uh, of Fitin. Uh, and he, over here, you can see in an area from 1945, an area, an aerial uh, photograph from 1945, the trenches which were cut by the IDF shortly after the horns of Fitin were taken by, uh, uh, by, uh, by the IDF. So they've actually uh, um, uh, cut trenches into, into the mountains. So archaeologically, basically, the battle never ended, okay, or the, the event never ed ended. Um, uh, as Collingwood would say. Now, but there is another memory, another way to understand this, and this is through the memory, the memory of the event. Um, the IDF is still looking after 72 years for, uh, for a soldier which was missing in action uh, during uh, a battle that occurred on the horns of Chitin on the 9th of June. 1948. His name was Yosef Margalit. Now, uh, so still, first of all, uh, we have the tendency of historical events to, to occur on the same battlefields again and again and again. Uh, Horatio Kitchener, when he reaches the, the horns of Fritin uh, during the Palestine, uh, the survey of Western Palestine, he comes across uh, a name on one of the, of the fields south of the horns of Fritin, which was called, this field was called Ard el Bonus, which translates as the land of the prince. Now, Horatio Kitchener, he goes to the villagers of Chitin and he asks them, who is this prince? And they're telling him, what do you mean? It's the guy that was slaughtered here. It's the prince of Karak that was slaughtered by Salah Hadin. So we're having here, uh, and, and Horatio Kitchener is basically writing back to the, to the PF and saying, uh, listen, this is, a, this is a, a, a case where we have an event, an historical event, which is memorized in the, names, in the name of one of, the, of, one of those uh, fields. But this is becoming even more interesting. When you look at cadastral maps from, from the 1930s, there is a field which is called uh, those, uh, those maps were issued by the, by, by, during the British mandate uh, on Palestine. One of those fields is called Ard Maktal el Nasra, Ard Maktal of Nasra, which translates the land of the massacre of the Christians. A field by the Horns of Chitin, which is called by the, by the locals, the land where we massacre the Christians. So, um, is this related to the Battle of Chitin? I can tell you that it's a little bit problematic because specifically on that field, we are also finding the remains of another battle, a Battle of Nazareth, Nazareth the Battle of Nazareth from April 1799. The Battle of Nazareth of Napoleon occurred on the same field. So is it the massacre of the Franks from 1187 or is it the ma massacre of the Franks from 1799? What is going on? So some things are memorized or are remembered. And as Collingwood said, the, the story never ends. The sto the ba basically, the event continues. But other things are forgotten. And you can see here in a, in a photograph by Masterman from 1908 that the mountain in the back of the photograph, which is the horns of Chitin, was known as Mount Beatitudes. 
Mount Beatitudes, the place where the Sermon, of, the Sermon on the Mount was given. Now, today, if you get on a tourist bus, uh, the bus will take you to the northern part of uh, the Sea of Galilee and not to the horns of Chitim. What is going on? Do we have a case here where, uh, where uh, uh, a traditional uh, site or a traditional uh, pilgrim site actually shifted its, uh, its location? Or uh, there were several locations and one one became more popular uh, during the 20th century, as you can see. But throughout the 19th century, this is where people would come in order to, uh, to commemorate the Sermon on the Mount. Is it because people understand more and more that one of the catastrophes of, uh, of the Christian world happened on the same fields where uh, Jesus gave one of his most important uh, sermons? Is it the reason why it was, uh, it was moved to a different location? I don't know, but this is just a, po a possibility that need to be thought, uh, thought about. So coming to the end of this, uh, of this whole idea, what I'm trying to say here, that when we're researching a battlefield, we, look, we have to look at things which are related to, to archeology, span to memory, but basically, before we start researching the material evidence or the archaeological evidence, we have to build it on two other layers. The second layer, the first layer would be the environmental evidence or the structural evidence. On this, we put the written evidence and the third kind of uh, uh, source of information that we have is actually, is actually uh, the archaeology. We're building here a sort of a pyramid from the, sh from the uh, long duration of, uh, of things all the way up to the short duration. And we're talking about, from um, uh, we have to understand the structural uh, changes, long structural changes, uh, which occur or change every thousand, uh, hundreds or even thousands of years. And then to understand periodical and cultural changes, uh, which are over, over that landscape. And only after we reconstruct the reconstruct the way that this landscape looked uh, throughout uh, human duration, we can understand how it actually looked uh, on the eve of the battlefield. This is a very long uh, work, which, which in order to do so, we need, we need to, to use many, many tools, which I will describe to you very short, shortly. Um, but uh, we have to do that in order to get finally to the top of the pyramid, uh, and really to understand if we want to know that with the arrowhead that we're found finding is actually in its right place okay and not and not and wasn't uh, moved with uh, with a bulldozer or by plowing or or something like this we have to we have to reconstruct the landscape and to understand all the different component components all the different features which are uh, which were made by humans uh, on this landscape we have to take into, into account things which are not archaeological at, at all, things like uh, uh, sunlight and moonlight, okay? And here you have, as I promised you, you have a table of, uh, uh, of July 1187, and we can see exactly, and you can see here, I've, I've actually, uh, uh, if you look over here, you can see uh, when was the sunset and when was the moonrise uh, on, uh, on uh, July 3rd, if we're talking about the time that, uh, for instance, as uh, that the Franks are at the pool of Maskana and they're encamping there throughout the night and the Muslims keeps on uh, uh, attacking them throughout the night. Uh, we can see, for instance, that the uh, uh, sunset was at uh, 6.50 p.m. And the moonrise what was at uh, uh, about a quarter, uh, uh, 14 past uh, midnight. It means that this was uh, the whole beginning of the night was quite dark, especially taking into account that when the moon did come up, it, only, uh, uh, it was only in 22% of uh, light capacity. So this is a very good night for uh, for dodging bullet, bullets or arrows, arrows in this case, but it would be uh, not a very good night to, for horse riding because it would be a very, a very dark night. Um, wind direction and velocity. 
they can uh, they can uh, they also should be taken into account and we can actually monitor those and those things don't don't change over a, a great periods of time which affects the of course dust but also the range of uh, of different uh, ballistic weapons such as uh, uh, as arrows um humidity and uh, relative humidity and temperature also things that uh, that can be monitored on and all of those things you you can't really get to a you know to to the real truth you know or to historical truth but it understanding those things or putting them into the into the into the pictures draws draws us a little bit closer to to the relative truth or to the to the truth of what actually happened during the events and therefore, um, the historical description is not enough. We have to take into account also env environmental aspects, such as the ones that I've just uh, um, uh, shown. Our main tool of research is landscape archaeology. In landscape archaeology, uh, we're, we're abandoned, abandoning the, the site-oriented uh, approach, which is very popular in, uh, in Israel and we're turning the landscape into, into the site, trying to understand how it was formed and how it was structured. This would allow us to understand or to find anomalies in the landscape and anomalies in the landscape, such as the ones that you see here on the Northern peak of the Horns of Chitim. They are the ones who are bringing us to very, uh, very interesting uh, points, including one of them, you can see this open area over here uh, which might have been used. Uh, this is a result of stone clearing, uh, maybe uh, uh, for positioning a, a tent at some point. Uh, historical uh, photography, uh, such as the photograph you have here from the 1890s, which led to the finding of, uh, 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 during the research of, uh, of, uh, of an Iron Age site from the 12th century BC, which I'm excavating uh, currently uh, with my my wife and with uh, with the great support of uh, Shirley and Ron Vanderham who are uh, uh, hearing us today. I will say a few words about this site towards the end of the uh, section, uh, towards the end of the of the lecture. Now, uh, with the time left for me, there isn't much. I would like to show you uh, the actual archaeology of the of the of the Battle of Chitin, starting with the Spring of Seferi itself. Uh, and uh, in about month, in about a month time, uh, an article will come out about the archaeology of the Seferi encampment. Uh, I was lucky enough to join a big project of the Israeli Antiquities Authority uh, after they heard one of my lectures about. Uh, I was talking there about horseshoes, and they told me, "Listen, Rafi, we have so many horseshoes and horseshoe nails at the springs of Seferi. Why don't you join us?" for this uh, for this uh, study and what we found there together with the two colleagues that you see here Yaniv Milevsky and Imrod Getzov from the Israeli Antiquities Authority they were excavating the a, a huge proto-historic site and I was excavating on the top layer uh, the first ever uh, encampment uh, or crusader encampment that was ever to be excavated so we're talking about the first time you know just imagine how many Roman army camps we have that been excavated by archaeologists. This is the first one, uh, the first encampment that was excavated uh, from the time of the Crusades. And it's fascinating. We have over 500 artifacts which are spread along an area of about 920 meters. Um, the project was a huge project. We're talking about millions, millions of dollars that were invested in order to, to widen the road to Nazareth that you see over here. And uh, what we found is an enormous amount of, of uh, Frankish artifacts, including arrowheads, as you see here, horseshoes, uh, a few coins of uh, King Baldwin III, actually. And um, you can see that the, um, um, the position of, the, of those artifacts is very close to each other. We could actually show uh, we made a study of uh, the different kinds of, uh, of horseshoes which were heard. There were two, kind, two main kinds of horseshoes. One was locally made and another one was made in Europe. A kind of horseshoe which is known, uh, ho sorry, a horseshoe nail, which is known as a violin key horseshoe. You can see this is the violin key 
Paul Strunel over here. You understand why it's called the violin key. Um, the closer we got to the to the spring house in Seferi, the more of the violin key uh, type of horseshoe nails we had. And those violin horseshoe keys are coming from Europe. You can find them. They were excavating in France in many different uh, uh, medieval uh, uh, sites and also in, uh, in England uh, itself. There's uh, uh, quite a big monograph about, uh, about excavations, uh, uh, the horse and its equipment from excavations in London, and those uh, uh, violin key horseshoes are, uh, are uh, were found in great numbers uh, in London. So we have uh, a European kind of horseshoe uh, nail, uh, which we found about 200 of those in, uh, in the springs of Seferi. And this gives us a very good idea about, uh, first of all, about the activity that was taking place in that encampment. And I told you, they started gathering up. They started uh, coming to Seferi already in May, about uh, two months before, uh, before the, uh, the Battle of Chitin, they already started uh, uh, coming to the camp. And we can say that one of the main activities that uh, they did in that uh, encampment was actually uh, shoeing horses. You don't want to the, the, your horseshoe to fall uh, throughout the battle, so they were just replacing the old horseshoe nails with new ones. And uh, you can almost imagine where a specific, where a specific uh, horse was shooed because of the, you can see how close uh, the different, the different uh, um, uh, artifacts were, were found one next to the other. Uh, this is, of course, taking into account stratigraphical uh, uh, things and, and also geomorphological uh, uh, studies related to the shiftments of soil and things like, uh, like this. But very, very interesting. We can almost say, due to the different kinds of artifacts, how they were uh, actually uh, uh, camped. And we can see different, different groups which were camped along uh, the sephir, the, the along the uh, uh, the waterbed of the of uh, uh, the valley of uh, of Seferi. we can see different groups according to the different kind of horseshoes horseshoes nails that they were using and different kind of uh, uh, of artifacts which uh, which were found uh, which were found in different uh, locations. We can follow the artifacts, and here I'm bringing you uh, to the plain of Chitin. This is the plain of Chitin, basically. This is the modern kibbutz Lavi. Uh, this is the school of Hodayot, sorry for the Hebrew here. Here you have the horns of Chitin, and all of those are metal artifacts which were found uh, along the way. And you can see a very high concentration over here. A few in the field, it's very hard to find them because of the plowing and and all the different things that happened. But then you see another big concentration around the horns of Chitin, and this can give you about an idea about the trail and the movement of the forces throughout the landscape. For instance, uh, when they crossed the watershed just next to Kibbutz, between Kibbutz Lavi and, uh, and Hodayot, this, uh, this school over here, this is to represent the watershed, we found uh, quite a few artifacts uh, which might be related. Uh, you can see here. This is we didn't find the sword, but we did. I did find this uh, this hand guard, as uh, as you can see over here, and this very interesting buckle um, with uh, with um, a, a heraldic symbol on it. You can see a crown over a shield, and a fleur de lis, which is upside down. And it could have been used mounted on a, basically on a, on a belt or maybe here in order to connect the sword to, uh, um, uh, to a chain. And you see it here. This is a very similar uh, uh, sign to the one that was used on the coins of Tripoli, of, uh, of the Principality of Tripoli. Raymond of Tripoli, as I told you, was uh, the Prince of the Galilee. And you can see on his coins, again, sort of a, uh, like uh, a crown over a shield, and here you have a fleur de lis which is pointing down, very similar to what you find over here. Now the question is, are those remains basically uh, telling us that there was a hand-to-hand -hand combat? And in a hand-to-hand -hand combat, when you have the two forces clashing together, you will have all sorts of things ripping off. 
or falling apart, you know, bits of metal flying over the place? Or on the other hand, was it due to the exhaustion of the crusaders at this point, they've just stripped themselves off from, uh, from, uh, from their clothing? So that's also a, a, a possibility. But we know that there was there was something uh, very uh, decisive was was happening on the, when they were crossing the uh, the watershed. Um, coins, coins which are found just below the uh, the horns of Chitin itself, on the on the uh, to the west, on the field to the west of the horns of Chitin. One of them, of Yusuf Salah Hadin ibn Ayub, which was minted in Khama a few years before the before, their, uh, before the, the battle was also found, just to a very interesting pile of rocks. Now there are many piles of rocks uh, um, uh, on the field to the, to the west of the horns of Hittim. Uh, some of them are the result of storm clearing. Uh, some of them are the result actually of activity that was done uh, in the uh, Middle Paleolithic early to middle Paleolithic, we're talking about a quarter of a million years ago. So it has nothing to do with, uh, uh, with the battlefield uh, itself. Uh, uh, but, and we are researching, we just uh, placed a paper about those, uh, those uh, stone piles. And uh, most of them are actually of, uh, of flint. Uh, those are the concentrations of, uh, of flint. Uh, but all around them, we're finding remains which are, which are related to, uh, to the battlefield. Uh, another interesting that, uh, thing that we have to take into account is the movement of, uh, uh, of, truth, uh, th uh, of troops throughout different ter terrains. Because once we've constructed the landscape and we know that the terrace wall uh, that we see today actually uh, uh, was there during the battlefield, we can understand on whether, or we can ask ourselves on whether a horse uh, or a rider or foot soldiers could, cr could climb over that terrace. How wide was the road system? How many people could travel a road at the same time? So uh, I will not go now into this table because we're very short with time, but we can actually see um, if we take the road, for instance, this is the road leading from the Springs of Seferi to, uh, to Maskana. This is where they walked on the first uh, day of the battle. And you can see it here in, in, uh, in an aerial photograph. This is, uh, this is the line of the road. The road is a very wide Roman road, about 10 meters in uh, 10 meters wide, a very wide one, but still taking uh, thousands of people and putting them into that road and taking into the account that they cannot walk, they couldn't have walked uh, anywhere apart from the road itself, because you can see all those terraces, which are part of a Roman field system, which was there at the time of the battle. You have to understand how many people could you put on that road and how how much would they have to stretch in order to to get to point a to point b and how many people would have to uh, walk like this so we have to take this into account when we are uh, a very similar kind of uh, field system is uh, can be found just to the um, 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 below the horns of Hittin, and uh, as you can see over here this kind of uh, field system is known as coaxial field systems, which were studied extensively by Shimon Gibson, who is present here today. And uh, we have to take those into account because this kind of field system is, uh, is typical to, um, uh, to, or to Roman activity in, uh, in, uh, in Israel uh, during the second century, uh, during the second century. So it means that the way that this um, uh, field system uh, was seen in this aerial photograph from 1945, as you can see it over here, with all of those uh, white lines representing terrace walls and boundary walls, this is very similar. Uh, well, in, um, this existed in one way or the other, uh, probably even more developed or better preserved during the battle itself. Um, if you see here the horns of Hittin, this is the volcano of the horns of Hittin. This is the field system to its south. The only way to cross this field system, this very elaborate and very complicated field system, is on a road which is 4.5 meters wide. How would you take a thousand knights and place them or run them through that, uh, through that road? You would have to do it. If you want to do it, you will have to do it 
um, in an Indian file sort of way. They would not, they will have to change their formation. And once they do so, they will be very, very vulnerable to attacks uh, by their enemies. What about the walls of Chitin themselves? And you have here a series of aerial photographs from the 1940, from 1945 onwards. And there's something very interesting to learn from it. The horns of Chitin uh, is also a biblical site. On the northern horn, on the northern horn of the volcano, there is a fortification from the 14th and 13th century BC. The main crater is also fortified with a wall from the 10th century BC. Now, if we look at these uh, photographs taken by John Garstang in the 1930s, you can see that this wall over here was actually still in place until it was opened uh, in 1949, after the, the taking of uh, the Horns of Hitin by the IDF. Which it means, in other words, that horses could not climb over that wall, could not go into and find into the, the crater on the Horns of Hitin and to find refuge over there, which means that if you wanted to get on the Horns of Hitin, if you wanted to find refuge on the Horns, on the hill itself, you would have to get of your horse. If you wanted to stay on your horse, you'd have to be uh, to stay on the field just to the west of, uh, of the mountain. And, uh, and that's about it. Um, it all comes to one, to one, uh, to one uh, specific uh, uh, map that I would like to show you now, or a scenario of what really happened at the final stages of, uh, of the battle. And what in the final stages of the battle, we have a very, very interesting description, uh, which was given to us by Salah Khadin's son, who was standing uh, right next to him. He's describing it to the Salah Khadin uh, biographer, who wasn't present, but he's describing exactly what happened. And he's basically telling us that uh, when they, they got close to, um, uh, to the mountain, um, Salah Adin was standing in a, at a place that he could see uh, the battlefield. He could see basically um, um, uh, the place that where the tent of the of the of the king was. The crusaders moved forward, but what happened to them? And the reason why I basically uh, I just uh, I go I go backward. This is the plain of Chitin. I'll do a little bit of explanation here. This is the plain of Chitin. It's a flat area. At the end of it, there is the mountain. As, as we said, the mountain of Chitin wasn't approachable to horses. Only foot soldiers could climb up on, the, on this mountain. On the north, there are very, very steep slopes. We're talking about uh, over 45 degrees in, uh, of an angle. 45 degrees of an angle is not something that can, uh, would bring a, a horse down safely if he doesn't have wings. So nobody can basically go down or escape from the plain of Chitin to the north because of those uh, slopes. On the south, there is this very uh, complicated uh, field system, very complicated field, field system. And the only way to bypass the horns of Chitin from the south is through this very, very narrow road, which goes between the terraces. So what happened is that the Franks were, were basically forced or moved towards the mountain and they were stuck in the area between the mountain and, uh, and the, the Muslim sources. Then at a certain point, the fields were set on fire. Now, the wind, the wind uh, in summer at the Horns of Chitin from nine in the morning is always blowing from west to the east, which means that there is only a specific point in time where the Muslims could actually uh, put the fields on fire. Uh, if they would do this at any, at any point when the Franks were to the west of them, they would actually create a smoke, a smoke screen that would cover uh, a possible escape of the Franks. Once the Franks have crossed uh, the point where Salah Adin was standing, they could, and to the east, they could put the fields on fire and basically, uh, the, the wind, the smoke, the fire would go towards the east and would capture the crusaders between, uh, between the horns 
and uh, and uh, and Saladin's uh, troops, and then basically just uh, run them down and uh, and and struck them against uh, against the hill. So this is uh, this is the final stages of the battle, um, uh, and this is almost where I'll be ending. I just want to tell you uh, uh, in one more minute. I'll take one more minute of your time to tell you about what we've been currently doing in the last two years. We've been excavating a fantastic site that was found accidentally while I was looking for the place where, or to the exact position where this uh, wonderful photograph of, again, Mount Beatitudes, as it titled, was taken by one of the members of the Bonfis family. And I was looking for the exact point where this photograph was taken from when I climbed those boulders. And this is a photograph that was taken by me, a lousy one from the same, from the same approximately the same angle. And while I was looking down at the boulders, I've noticed that I've actually climbed through a huge megalithic building, huge building, which was uh, 7.4 7 meters by 7.4 meters, which was built from megalithic uh, stones, like real big stones. Some of them weigh over seven tons. Um, the site is just to the uh, southeast of uh, the horns of Ripin. It's called uh, Khirbet El Kankuza. It's a small site, um, and this is how it looks. It's a fantastic location, and uh, you can see the building over here. Very interesting features. There is a, there are a few standing stones. Some of them are uh, are white. All of this is basalt, but the standing stones are white. Over here, there is a rock at uh, altar. There is a high place here behind. Very interesting site from the. Uh, uh, late uh, Bronze Age and very early uh, Iron Age uh, site. And this is where I've been focusing my research in the last few years together with, with my wife, uh, Rona, who is also an archaeologist. Um, and um, this is where I'll end. There's still many things to, uh, to study on the plane of 15 regarding the historical event itself and also uh, other things which are related to other historical uh, and archaeological periods um, uh, uh, to learn about. So thank you all very much. Um, thank you very much indeed, Rafi. Uh, applause is uh, understood. Those of you who are on there and want to do so, I will unmute. Um, in fact, I'll unmute everyone and then we can have some proper vigorous applause. Uh, or you may wave. Um, good. Uh, so may we, that was um, fascinating, absolutely fascinating lecture. Um, it makes us all want to be there with you as our guide, I think. Um, and very rich material indeed. Um, and uh, I would like to go straight on to questions. Um, I have one from Ellen, uh, two questions from Ellen Rosenberg. I'd like to invite her to put them herself. Okay, I'm here. Um, Hi, right. The place of the fire, was that, do you know that from a written source or did you figure that out all by yourself? No. And also well, in the, I, the, area, I, I, the area that they were trapped, the crusaders were trapped once the fire started, did you look for artifacts there? Okay, um, so, I couldn't elaborate too much about, you know, wind directions and how it was, I, how actually I monitored uh, this, but uh, um, it comes from, you know, it, it's trying to be make the best out of something which is, uh, uh, which is very unfortunate. And um, there is a plan in the last 15 years to put uh, uh, huge wind turbines uh, over the plain of Chitin. Uh -huh. And uh, um, each one of those turbines is supposed to be over 100 and exactly actually 182 meters in height. In order, so just before uh, the company which decided to, to do so, uh, before they invest so much money, they monitored the wind uh, on the plane of Khatin for, uh, for about 15 years. And I was, I was able to, uh, uh, to get a little bit of the information from that study 
to understand about the wind velocity and direction throughout the year, the total year in Khatin. And there is a certain way that the winds behave. You can see in, in a, when we're thinking about, about wind, it's something which is very lucid. If you look at, 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 at wind and the way that it uh, uh, create, uh, it's behaves over the long duration of time, you can actually see uh, some sort of uh, 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 um, um, uh, things which are consistent. Um, so it's it's basically it's based on that a little bit of uh, of logic, but still it's uh, it's as good as as the wind. It's it's it it will be it will be an interpretation, but this is something that they put into into the research to for people to think about. So don't come to this out as you know as like as uh, as uh, as an accurate fact, as something that really happened, because there are no sources which are actually talking about about this, uh, but it, it, comes, it, comes, it comes down from, uh, from my understanding of, uh, of, uh, of the events. Regarding uh, uh, the second questions about the artifacts from the final stages of, uh, of, uh, of the battle. Well, we do have a few buckles, we have a few arrowheads, um, coins, things like this. The problem is that out of all of that final area, the final, you know, the final, um, the plain of Chitin itself, only 15 dunams, which is about five acres, I think, of land, uh, were not, were left untouched. In the last 72 years, since Kibbutz Lavi is there, and there's been quite a lot of development. And this is something that took me some while to figure out. And only about five, five acres of the entire area were left untouched. And this is where you find the artifacts sorry, in situ, we, 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 without them being, being moved. Um, also in my study, I really, I, I focused on the landscape reconstruction uh, and not so much on the artifacts themselves. I, I have plenty of artifacts from the Springs of Sefari to, to show that it can be done. But when it came to the battlefield itself, I thought it's much more important to understand if a road existed, if, if a, a specific uh, a, a stone wall, uh, which is cutting it, existed at the time of, uh, of the battle. Uh, and I thought that those features would give me a much better idea about the movement. Uh, to go back in October with a team of uh, metal detectorists and, uh, and, and to work in those specific places specific areas which were not bulldozed or moved or plowed uh, so we can actually uh, find more artifacts and learn a little bit more or get a little bit more from the material signature of the battlefield itself. Was it? Thank you, thank okay. you very much. Um, uh, now we have a question uh, which relates quite closely from William Rains, are you there, William? Are you wanting to ask, ready to oh, ask your question? Oh, yes, I'm there, yes. Right. Um, thank you. It, it, it's quite common in um, ancient um, Roman battlefields or and medieval ones um, for soldiers to bury valuables before a battle. Uh, oh. Did that happen at Hattin or was that impossible because, because um, it was conducted on the move, so to speak? Um, well, interestingly enough, um, I, I, I'll, tell, I'll say two things in that account. We seem to have a, such a activity which is done at the Springs of Sefari. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, we're finding quite a lot of uh, uh, gilded artifacts, you know, like hairpins, and, uh, and buckles and all sorts of things which were which were buried in the field or, or left behind. It's not the sort of thing that you would uh, really leave behind you because they were valuable. So this we find uh, in the encampment. Uh, interesting enough. Uh, well, there is there is one one buried uh, treasure, which uh, which is uh, might be like the, the the treasures of all treasures because one of the sources is basically telling us. It's a, it's a Templar knight which, uh, which survived the battle. Uh, 
and he, he comes to um, 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 at a certain point the ruler of the kingdom of Jerusalem telling him that he managed to snatch from the Muslim he managed to take back the relic of the true cross and to bury it in the fields of Chitim interestingly enough they carry out an expedition to find that relic, to find that important uh, important relic. You can call it the first ever exped archaeological expedition in Israel. The problem was that it was done uh, because, because the, the informer, uh, they were, or, or the, the, the sergeant who was taking them to the battlefield, because in, it's interesting, the Templar knight who said that he buried uh, uh, the relic couldn't, didn't know how to get to the battlefield. Already problematic. So uh, they find the sergeant who took them, who took them there, but he took them on one condition. He took the Templar and another few uh, uh, warriors there on one condition that they will only uh, travel throughout the night and will only dig throughout the night because they didn't want them to be, uh, to be discovered there during the day. So it's an archaeological expedition which went to, an, to a place that couldn't be recognized by the person who was leading it and was only, was only excavated throughout the night. So it's a very unreliable source. Of course, they came back with empty, empty handed. So, uh, and of course, I'm not looking for the relic of the true cross and the horns of Kitin, but uh, it's, uh, it's a very interesting uh, story on that, uh, on that account. So, uh, <laughs> treasures. Aren't we all looking for treasures? Thank you. Thanks, Rafi. And again, um, quite a uh, closely related question um, from Dudley. Uh, are you there, Dudley? Dudley, Dudley. Dudley? <laughs> Otherwise, I'll I can, read this I can, I, can, I can see him on the top right. <laughs> can you see him? Can he hear us? Yes. No? All right. Dudley, I think I've unmuted everybody as far as I know. Um, uh, Dudley is muted. Oh, no, he's Hello, can you hear me now? Right. Yes, I can. I think Raphael can as well. Yes. Right. Um, you mentioned the artifacts um, which have been distributed by ploughing and were hard to find. Um, what I want to know, was the ploughing mainly the one immediately afterwards, the medieval, or was it modern ploughing? And the second part is, um, are battlefield artifacts less loved to damage by ploughing than um, a modern site, such as the burial? I would imagine they could be less vulnerable to ploughing damage if they're small items which would be to, just tossed around rather than damaged. Yeah, so... Um... Oh, you, 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 you're definitely right about, about that aspect, because if we were looking for, uh, for metal artifacts, uh, uh, they will not be damaged much by, by the plowing, but they will just be moved around. For me, it was, it was interesting and it was important to find things in situ. So for me, a place that was plowed is basically, is basically uh, problematic. Uh, I can I can I can see specific places on the on the plain of Chetin which were not plowed at all. Okay, those who were plowed were plowed already in antiquity. Actually, the modern plowing taking place on the fields of Chetin today is less destructive than the traditional plowing. The reason is because Kibbutz Levi is using a very uh, um, um, interesting and very advanced kind of plowing uh, um, in order to not to make the soil, which is very clayish, very, the basalt soil is very clayish, they have a very thin layer of, uh, of soil over the bedrock. So in order not to, to, to turn it too much, so during the winter, basically the, the soil will be washed off from their fields, what they are doing, they are basically shooting the grains into the ground. They're basically, it's a, it's a kind of plowing. It's like uh, they are placing, uh, they're not turning over the soil. They're actually shooting it into, into the ground in order not to, to turn the soil too, too much. So the, ply, the plowing itself, which is taking today, in the let's say in the last 20 years is not this destructive but there was enough plowing that was done uh, the year before that 
There were studies, studies conducted about plowing, and, um, uh, and I have to say that I've, I've also encountered some, uh, uh, not in Chetin, but in other studies, uh, I've encountered uh, uh, bones which, uh, which were plowed, uh, a little bit like, uh, like the source that I started with. And uh, uh, we are doing, uh, currently I'm, I'm running a study about a different case study, about, about uh, what happens to, uh, um, uh, to bones, uh, the way that they are cut, the way that they are, uh, they are crushed by different kinds of, uh, of plows. Uh, it's not, it's uh, sorry for, for being so uh, plastic, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> we, are, we are trying to understand that. The, the reason I'm doing it is actually for, it's more related to, uh, to things that I'm doing, which are related to, uh, to trying to locate uh, uh, IDF soldiers who were missing in action in, the 19, in 1948. Uh, and not necessarily to, to ancient battlefields, but I think that it's a very similar kind of, uh, of process which we're trying to, to understand. Um, well, thank you. There are two very quite unexpected answers there. Uh, uh, very, very interesting. <laughs> and um, we have two more questions, um, and then I suppose we should uh, uh, let our speaker off the hook. Um, one comes from David Shamash, and may I um, uh, perhaps, David, um, merge it um, with a question from, from me. So David asks, how many, do we know how many soldiers each side had? Is there archaeological evidence for that? But I was rather going to ask from the other side, um, could you give us possibly a uh, Rafi, in, in, in a couple of sentences. So it's how, it's how, how do you know? You said, how do you know? How mm. do you know? Yes, I thought I read that. Um, sorry, did I miss that? I thought that's no. what I said. How do, you, how do you know how many soldiers? My question would be, um, from the other side, um, could you tell us, in a nutshell, what the literary sources and documentary sources are, for the battle, from which presumably the main outlines, like uh, numbers, however mm -hmm. unreliable, yeah. uh, of troops yeah. would come, and, and particularly any from the from the uh, from Saladin's side. So two questions rolled into one there. Well, it is it, it, the the two questions are related to to each other, uh, basically. Um, what's nice about what's a, one of the reasons that I picked uh, uh, the Battle of Chitin as, as my main case study is the reason that it was uh, that it was uh, researched in a quite a good way from the historical perspective. First of all, we have uh, uh, eyewitness forces or, or uh, uh, from from both sides of uh, and from both armies. Um, from people who were part uh, part of the campaign itself, uh, up to a certain escape, uh, extent, some of them have fled the battlefield at a certain point. Other, they stayed for throughout the whole uh, campaign. From both from both uh, sides, uh, one of them is uh, uh, we have uh, a description which was published or uh, got into uh, the writings of Abu Shama by uh, by El Mukadesi. Uh, Ahmad the Din, we have so we have and we have uh, this uh, this also uh, a letter that was issued by Salah Hadin itself a few months later from Ashkelon that he writes about uh, about the uh, about uh, the battlefield and he, he basically he speaks about the water source that the Crusaders were uh, were reaching on the first day of uh, of the battle and then they've abandoned it and things like this. This is from uh, from the Muslim side of things. From the Frankish side of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, of, uh, of those sources, we have a letter that was sent to uh, the head of the hospitalers in Italy uh, about a month a month after the action, uh, which describes the battle. We have another source of uh, of one of the uh, 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 soldiers. Or one of the knights who fled the battlefield after the first day who was part of the rear guard. So we have quite a lot of uh, of, uh, uh, of written evidence, which gives us uh, the basic idea of what 
for what really happened there. We all we had, all I had to do is to put in the the historic, the environmental and archaeological uh, issues, and to try to understand the the, so, the sources uh, through them. Regarding the number, well, the numbers really, really vary, varying. In my presentation, I I didn't want to. Uh, to really to, uh, to mix things up. So I've been a little bit minimalistic, okay? I've been a little bit minimalistic. I was talking about, um, there is an agreeable number of warriors because we know from other sources and from other studies which were conducted about the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, that in total, when everybody uh, came to the battlefield, he had around uh, 1,200 knights, armed knights. So this is, this is a sort of a fixed number, which is based not just on the sources on the battle itself, but also on other, other events. We know how many uh, knights were uh, uh, owned, uh, were uh, under, the, uh, under the, the king himself, how many were for, for the hospitalers, the templars, we can make a sort of, uh, we have an idea about this. We have no idea about, about how many foot soldiers, but we have to take into account that for every night, he had at least four sergeants, at least four people who were helping him, who were protecting him. So this will bring us to a minimum number of 5,000, 6,000 6, uh, foot soldiers. But John, John France, for instance, in a book that he recently published, is talking about 40,000, 40,000 foot soldiers only in the, in the Frankish side. The Muslims is the same thing. We're talking about 12, about 12,000 uh, 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 armed uh, 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 mounted archers, okay? 12,000, 12,000, not, not uh, 1,200, 12,000 mounted, mounted archers and an unknown number of foot soldiers. Foot soldiers are usually not, uh, not, uh, not mentioned, uh, uh, but we know that there were at least uh, a double, double, double the number of the, of, the, uh, of the mounted archers, which is about 24,000 uh, foot soldiers, mu Muslim foot soldiers. So the numbers vary. Um, Another, another group that we should take into account are the Turkopols. The Turkopols were actually uh, Frankish uh, warriors who were riding uh, under uh, the hospitalers and templars, but they were fighting in an Easter traditional way of, uh, of fighting. They were fighting like in, uh, uh, they were basically mounted archers, but they were part of, uh, of the, of the, uh, of the forces uh, that uh, the French were uh, were using, and there is a very very interesting interesting article that was part, which is based on the MA thesis of uh, Yuval Noah Harari, the historian who might you probably heard about, an Israeli historian from the Hebrew University who wrote about the Turkopols, who gives us a, a good idea about how many, how many of those were were also present in uh, in different. Uh, 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 Frankish battlefields. So um, uh, the numbers vary. Um, I I tend to be a little bit minimalistic when when it comes to to those numbers. But uh, like everything, many other things in history, we, we can only uh, sometimes it's my my guess is as good as uh, as anyone else's. Well, thank you. So that, 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 that's really uh, important. So we can take away from that, A, that there are all, uh, all sorts of um, bits of evidence in the rich source material for this battle, B, that a quite a lot of work has been done on making d appropriate uh, deductions, and so C, that while your figures are by no means certain, they are a, a, a Pretty, <laughs> they're a pretty sensible guess. Now we do have another couple of of um, questions, and I, 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 if you can, can you take a couple more? And um, yeah, no problem. We, we should. Um, it's getting towards half past uh, five here, so um, we should be drawing it's... towards a close. But let me just um, invite. We have one from Benjamin. Uh, should I read it quickly? 
Is there any indication or way of knowing if the violin key horseshoe nails were produced domestically to the Latin kingdoms by Frankish craftsmen versus imported from Europe? Well, we do have a document of uh, 30,000 uh, horseshoes which were, which were brought to the hospitalars from France during the 12th century. Uh, those probably came with horseshoes. Uh, uh, one of the things that I haven't managed to do yet, yet is do uh, a methodological uh, study which will try to track the sources of the metal. Um, um, so I can't, I can't really say that uh, if those were locally made or not. What I can say at this point, at least, I hope I will be able to say this in the future after we conduct such a, such a research. What I can say at this point is that horseshoe nails are much easier to make than uh, than the horseshoes themselves. <laughs> so we could we could we could uh, we could be in a situation where the horseshoes themselves are brought over in mm. great numbers, and then the horseshoes the horseshoe nails are locally made. Uh, oh, you know what? I have I, I actually have an I completely forgot about it. But one of the one of the nails from uh, uh, from Seferi. Uh, was uh, was half baked, if I may say. It was it was it was still in the process of making. One of the nails would be found. One of the one of the violin key horseshoe nails was still in the process of making. So uh, um, thanks for pointing me that to that. I have to add this to to, to my next article. Um, they were probably locally made, yeah, because we we find evidence for the production, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> and on site. Well, thank you. And, and finally, from Victoria, and very quickly, I think a yes no answer is possible. She asks Aco, Acre, Saint Jean d'Arc wasn't mentioned. Was there any involvement in the troop movements of Aco? Well, when when the forces gathered to the springs of Seferi, uh, they came from through, all throughout the land, from uh, well, not just the Latin Kingdom of Jerusalem, but also from uh, the Principality of Antioch and from you know from different oh. uh, from different uh, different places uh, altogether. So uh, all around, and they all gathered to the springs of Seferi. Uh, interestingly enough, the main baggage uh, during the siege, after the after the Battle of Ritin, uh, Salah uh, started uh, taking one by now one all the the Frankish settlement and uh, and and castles in the in the in the land and um, um, Can you make this and this basic work? and and during oh, yeah. and uh, sorry someone is uh, is in yeah the I, I yeah and interestingly throughout throughout the siege of Akko, during the Third Crusade, his main camp was in the springs of Seferi. Also, at, at the end of the Battle of Chitin, Salah Hadin is gathering his troops at the springs of Seferi, okay? And from there, they're moving to Akko. From there, they're moving to Akko. So but there presumably, is, some of these arrivals from Antioch, say, came by sea and landed at Akko, and then... Uh, well, people, and uh, saying Antioch, it's not necessarily the, the right um, uh, uh, equation, but, but it's, uh, they're coming from, they're coming from all over. And, and, uh, and some of them by sea, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, um, probably, yeah. Yes. Probably by sea. It's, uh, they, had, they had a good, they, have, uh, they, have over, they had over two months to, uh, to gather their forces in the springs of Sacre. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you very much. I can only add that I have received other chat messages saying what an excellent lecture this has been and how much people have enjoyed it. Um, very interesting and generally superb. So I will only echo those words on behalf of the society. And um, thank you very much indeed, audience. Um, uh, you were splendid. We ended up, I think, with a maximum of 88 or 90 people, um, which is terrific. And um, we have ended up with um, certainly 
a substantial number of us who are extremely interested um, in, in um, also the answers to the questions. Thank you for being so patient with the questions. So see you all again and um, watch this space for our coming events. Um, and um, a final thanks then to Rafi, maybe some applause, anybody, or some uh, reactions, right. one can put a uh, thanks, thumbs up. Thanks again to, to, Thank Tess, you. to, to you, Tessa, and to, and to Sheila and Anthony and all of the committee. It was great being part of this. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye.